Hello, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for Just Do Business, celebrating Black excellence through the LEAD Partner Program. I'm Jack Lavin, President and CEO of the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce, and it's my privilege to welcome you to today's conversation. Chicago was once the center of Black economic progress in the United States. Today, we're taking action to prove that the free enterprise system works for everyone, including our Black community. Promoting Black-owned companies will be critical to Chicago's economic recovery and to our future. Last year, the Chamber's Economic Recovery Task Force was comprised of 25 local business and civic leaders. Their objective? Identify the must-haves and action items of reopening Chicago's economy, while simultaneously prioritizing safety, trust, and equity. Recognizing the profound impact that COVID-19 has had on Chicagoland's economy, as well as a disproportionate impact on communities of color, we introduced the Chicago Pledge. Through this pledge, we want businesses to buy locally, hire locally, and invest locally in Chicago area companies, particularly minority, women, and disadvantaged business enterprises, small businesses, and diverse talent pipelines. We want people to listen and learn and facilitate and promote conversations about structural inequities. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is important to the Chamber because it's good for business and good for Chicago. Diversity is key to innovation, resiliency, and success in this global economy, which is more competitive than ever. And frankly, it's what must be done to address the barriers and unfair conditions for marginalized populations, particularly Black-owned businesses, so we can have equity of opportunity for all and achieve our full economic potential. Government programs alone will not get us there. Economic opportunity for all will. That is why we need to just do business together. Some progress has been made, but much more must be done. The Chicagoland Chamber is your partner in this effort and we will work with you to move the needle forward. That's exactly why we are here today. Just Do Business is a movement and a chain reaction approach that starts with organizations like yours. You can participate in the Business Leadership Council's newest initiative, the Lead Partner Program, by evaluating your current vendor relationships and finding areas where you can make the commitment to work with Black-owned companies. It is an extension of the Chicago Pledge to build the fabric of our community and make it strong. The Lead Partner Program gives us a tangible way to just do business together. This is not to check a box, but rather to create that chain reaction. We have a terrific group lineup of speakers who represent the breadth and depth of organizations in our communities. I'd like to thank Chamber Board Member and CEO of EKI Digital, Robert Blackwood Blackwell Jr., who will share the background and history of Chicago's Black business community and his mission called the Alpha Mission to get companies involved in the LEAD Partner Program. Robert has been a friend for over 20 years, and he is the most passionate person I know on this topic. Additionally, thank you to Avis Lavelle, the CEO of the Business Leadership Council, for your commitment to this mission and strong partnership between the Chamber and the BLC. Thank you to Chamber member and CEO, Mes CEO of Mesero, Richard Price, for being here. Richard is a longtime friend and mentor and an outstanding leader in Chicago's business and civic community. We also have Tyrone Stoudemire of Chamber Member Hyatt. Thank you to Mike Lechtenberger and Peter Sanderson for being here. And thank you to Congresswoman Robin Kelly. We are delighted to have all of you with us today to share your thoughts and experiences. After you hear from today's speakers and panelists, you will receive a link to the Business Leadership Council's website where you can get information and commit to supporting the Black community, and just do business. We will also have a link on the Chicagoland Chamber website. Thank you again for joining us today. I would now like to introduce U.S. Congresswoman Robin Kelly, who represents Illinois' second district. We have been friends for almost 20 years when she became a state representative in 2002, and I became the director of the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. We've worked together on many economic development projects and creating jobs throughout Chicagoland. She is a great friend of the business community 
and serves on the U.S. House Energy and Commerce Committee. She is a leading voice of the Congressional Black Caucus and is committed to pro promoting Black-owned companies to ensure they have the resources they need to advance and grow. Congresswoman, I also want to give you a personal thank you for your commitment and leadership to prevent gun violence. Your work is more important than ever. Please welcome Congresswoman Robin Kelly. Thank you so much, Jack. Always good to see you. And yes, we've known each other a long, long time, uh, since 10 years old, maybe 20 years. But thank you for inviting me here today to update you on my efforts to help support Black-owned companies and the latest initiatives to significantly increase Black vendor partnerships. And thank you to the Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce and the Business Leadership Council for hosting this important webinar. Your work supporting the Black community through economic participation is opening doors to more Black-owned business. When Black businesses do better, we all do better. Small businesses are the foundation of our communities. In New York, my grandparents started Ross's Grocery Store, a mom and pop grocery store where my grandparents' grit and entrepreneurial spirit created economic opportunity and food security for so many in their Harlem neighborhood. That's where I learned not only the value of hard work, but the importance of small businesses in our communities. In Washington, I've, I've been working with my colleagues to find ways to increase black participation in federal government contracts. The federal government has a target of 5% of federal contracts going to minority owned businesses. The Biden administration has said it wants to increase this number to 15%. This will be a huge benefit for minority-owned businesses and increased competition for federal contracts. I'm also looking at a way specifically for Black-owned businesses to have uh, their own uh, percentage. And there should be greater opportunities for Black-owned businesses to procure federal contracts, such as a target for federal contracts to Black-owned businesses. Currently, only Indian tribes can also receive so sole source awards in excess of 4 million generally and 7 million for manufacturing contracts, even when contracting officers reasonably expect that 8A firms would apply. Additionally, individually owned firms, 8A firms are generally prohibited from receiving additional sole source awards once they have received a combined total of competitive and sole source awards in, except, in excess of 100 million but Indian tribes are not subject to this limitation. It is important that black owned firms are on a level playing field and be able to take advantage of the same benefits as other economically disadvantaged groups. I am also working on reintroducing my Women and Minority Equity Investment Act, which would allow women and minority owned businesses to take advantage of the 8A program and still receive private capital investment as long as the investment is coming from a majority of women or minority investors. Here in Illinois, second district, I recently formed an SBA economic development advisory committee to ensure that the concerns of small businesses are directly addressed. The advisory council gives business owners, contractors and executives the opportunity to speak up and make suggestions. The goal is to take their ideas and suggestions back with me to Washington and incorporate them into legislation. Business owners and Chamber of Commerce is from Chicago, South Suburban Cook County, Will County, and Kankakee County have joined my advisory committee. The council features many, many Black business owners. They have helped produce webinars on the PPP application process, marketing, and branding websites. It's a part of a series of webinars the advisory committee will host to inform small business owners about the SBA, as well as other educational programs that are available. Just like the PPP webinar, future programs will stream live on Facebook and will be posted on my YouTube channel so those unable to live stream can access them later. If you would like to join, please contact my office at 708 six seven nine zero zero seven eight and leave a message for my district outreach manager april williams luster i am very committed to seeing what we can do in congress and in the city of chicago to uplift uh, our many black businesses and help create more thank you so much for your attention and now i'd like to introduce miss avis labelle executive director of 
the business leadership account. Avis began her reporter in Chicago and has gone on to serve our community hospitals, assistant secretary in the Department of Health and Human Services under the Clinton administration, and currently as president of the Board of Commissioners of the Chicago Park District. She knows so much about Chicago, and we are so lucky to have her serving as executive director of the Business Leadership Council. And now I, I will turn things over to you, my friend, Avis. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Kelly, and thank you so much for your steadfast commitment to empowering women and minority-owned businesses. Uh, we know that we will actually get something done with you at the helm. Uh, and my thanks also to the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce under the leadership of Jack Lavin uh, for hosting, co-hosting this webinar, but also for your strong commitment to the Lead Partner Program and to the Just Do Business concept. The Chicago Pledge is a very important pledge, and it says that you are going to really put some action behind the conversation to grow Black businesses here, and everybody will benefit from that. I am. Uh, Next, introducing Tyrone Studemeyer, who is the Global Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Hyatt Hotel Corporation. And I will say I've known Tyrone for quite a long time, and I will say also that Hyatt has been a leader in the field of diversity and inclusion. Uh, the Lead Partner Program, our program, is a central tenet to the concept of just doing business with African-American businesses, but it is something that Hyatt has been doing for a long time under Tyrone's leadership. So I'm gonna let Tyrone tell us about the Hyatt platform for black economic inclusion and how they've been doing it for a long time under his leadership. Tyrone, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Avis, and I appreciate the invitation from you and Saul Charles Smith and Congressman Kelly. Thank you for your wonderful leadership and commitment to Chicago and, and all the great work you're doing there in Congress for us. Um, I would like to start off by saying that Hyatt, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion has been a part of Hyatt's DNA since its conception. In 1967, the height of civil rights, when Martin Luther King was attempting to have his combined luncheons with blacks and whites in Atlanta, Georgia, no hotel allowed him. They all said, no, you will, we don't want your business. It can't come here. And as we were digging the hole for Hyatt, he stood in front of the hole and said, I hope that hotel does right by us. And we answered that call and we did. We were the first hotel to provide, to allow blacks and white to come together, to honor and celebrate their differences and look at their similarities to close the racial gap around hate and bigotry. So that's been a part of our, our DNA. And so we, we then, if we fast forward to today and we look at what's happening in society with the death and murder of George Floyd, that most organizations decided either to respond or to react to the death and murder of George Floyd and the, and the, and the economic issues in the black community. And at Hyatt, we began our program called Change Starts Here. It starts with us first before we can help anybody else. We have to look at what's going on with Hyatt. Then we'll look at how do we help others. We've committed to three areas, who we employ, develop, and advance, who we support, who we buy from, and who we partner with. As you'll see in the categories, these are global goals, and these are five-year goals. So by 2025, we expect to hit this goal. We're going to look at doubling representation of our women, VP levels, and above, with a special focus on Black leaders. We're gonna double representation of women in VP above outside the United States, and then double representation of female general managers globally and people of color within the United States in respective groups and looking at focus on blacks. So you can see we're focusing on blacks. This is the first time I've been able to really have a scorecard that talks about black folks. So let me be honest and transparent uh, with you here that no one pushed back because we saw the issues and we knew we needed to close our own gaps. Then who we support, we're looking at the, a program called Rise High. It is a program that focuses on youth between the ages of 16 and 24. Some have deemed them as opportunity youth. Those who are not, have not graduated college, who are not going to graduate high school or not going to college, we feel we can meet them where they are, develop them and provide them with a certificate so they can not only work at Hyatt, but at Marriott, at Hilton, or either, any other hospitality company of their, of their liking. We're going to increase representation by 45% in the black community. Then we're gonna look at our financial contribution. We committed a million dollars to focus on how we partner with the right organizations in the black community to help us find that youth. We have partnerships with the Obama Foundation, partnerships with um, 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 
uh, um, uh, Urban Alliance and other partners to help us to be able to identify those youth to expand that pool. We have track records on people going from doorman to general managers, from housekeeper to general manager. It is great succession. We feel we can close that gap with the particular youth. And then this is what I'm most uniquely proud of as a global organization. If we don't conquer our own backyard, we won't be global, right? So we're now providing 1,000 pro bono hours to the black community as because of the pandemic has hit them extreme, extremely hard as we build to help them to rebuild. Because the hotel industry, more than 100 million people have been impacted and most of our hotels are still closed. But we feel that we could provide pro bono hours from our corporate office to our colleagues. Uh, for, for, uh, with, with our colleagues in the community. I'll give an example, and it, and it festered on beyond Chicago and went through the regions. And in Atlanta, Georgia, our general manager opened up our hotel and allowed barbers, black barbers to cut hair on the rooftop. We also found an African-American male who actually was selling macaroni and cheese that lost his lease due to the pandemic. We invited him to come into our hotel and to bake his macaroni and cheese and sell it out of our hotels and provided him with infrastructure to provide help with his social media platform and his digital platform to make sure he was selling appropriately. Last but not least is also, and several of these are coming up at some highlights, an African-American female in, in, in Baltimore lost her lease as a baker. We invite her to come in and bake her baked goods and sell her baked goods out of a hotel that's closed. So we're taking our what we can and provide it to the community to help them to continue to build. So these pro bono hours, I think we, uh, when we rolled this out in June, I had 75 hours from June to January, only to end the year with 300 and no, 475 hours of volunteer hours. It's something that our colleagues want to be able to get back to the community. We continue to do that. Last but certainly not least, who we buy from, who we partner with. That we, uh, we um, as last year, many didn't spend much, but we're giving 10% of our spend to the black community and women of, and women of color so they can continue to grow. We've identified three to five last year, but we also entered into our hotels and looked at our system to determine if we've ever done any business once or any business at all with a black vendor, we were able to identify 1800 vendors across the United States that were black, that we have done business with that we want to continue to do business and continue to grow. We're partnering with Chicago Urban League on Project Next to look at how we help develop those next generation of entrepreneurs to support there as well and partnering with BLC to make sure that we're relevant and that we provide the stuff behind our fluff. We've been talking about this issue far too long. We've been having these conversations about race and gender and orientation. Now is the time. We're at a moment where we all can make a commitment and do this together, but we have got to have stuff behind our fluff. I hope this was helpful and instrumental for you guys today. Thank you for allowing me an opportunity and a platform to share a small portion we're doing at Hyatt to make a difference. Thank you, Avis. Thank you, Tyrone. And I will say uh, to everyone, this is such a clear example of how at the heart of it is a commitment to do business, but it is a very robust approach that flows from this and a commitment that the Hyatt has had for decades. So we thank you for your participation. Uh, next, I'm gonna introduce Robert Blackwell, who we've talked about ever so briefly. And he is the person whose passion drives the lead partner effort that the Business Leadership Council has been advocating as the centerpiece of our Black Economic Empowerment Platform. Robert is the CEO of EKI Digital, and he is a very busy man. He's also CEO of Killer Spin, which is the world's leading table tennis engagement brand. But Robert's real passion is the lead partner program, and he'll talk about his alpha mission and the opportunities that flow to all when you embrace the philosophy of just doing business with black owned businesses. So Robert, welcome. Robert, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me today. And uh, I'm gonna try to get, for the sake of time, get through this uh, presentation pretty quickly. And what I want to talk about is a mission to prove that the free enterprise system works for everybody. Oops, let me go here. Can everybody see my screen? Can you, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful. 
Okay, this is, uh, this is me. I describe myself as an unemployable math misfit uh, that turned out to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> um, what I say is imagine how much better our city will be when the black community participates in the economy in proportion to our talent. So kind of after the whole George Floyd incident happened, I wrote a series of articles called Love is a Verb. The theme of that was that nobody can protect or feed their family based on your sympathy. So if you want to help somebody, go buy something from somebody. So we're going to talk about quickly the Alpha Mission. And the goal of the Alpha Mission is to help Chicago go from worst to first. We used to be first. Now we need to get back to first, being the number one big city for black business. The outcomes are $2 billion in black business, 50% drop in crime, and 1,000 black boys pass a calculus test. I believe if you pass a calculus test, you can do anything. And the lead partner program ties black business participation to the social capital that creates hope, aspiration, and opportunity for everybody. I'm gonna play this uh, uh, video by President Kennedy entitled, We Choose to Go to the Moon. We meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. The greater our knowledge increases, the greater our ignorance unfolds. No man can fully grasp how far and how fast we have come. But condense, if you will, the 50,000 years of man's recorded history in a time span of about a half a century. Stated in these terms, we know very little about the first 40 years, except at the end of them, advanced man had learned to use the skins of animals to cover them. Then about 10 years ago, under this standard, man emerged from his caves to construct other kinds of shelter. Only five years ago, man learned to write and use a cart with wheels. Christianity began less than two years ago. The printing press came this year. And then less than two months ago, during this whole 50 year span of human history, the steam engine provided a new source of power. Newton explored the meaning of gravity. Last month, electric lights and telephones and automobiles airplanes became available. Only last week did we develop penicillin and television and nuclear power. This is a breathtaking pace and such a pace cannot help but create new ills as it dispels old. So it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are a little longer to rest, to wait, if this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. We shall send to the moon, 240,000 miles away, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body and then return it safely to Earth. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked.
Okay. Sorry, guys, I'm going to uh, try to move this forward. Sorry, I have to go back here. Okay. Okay. So I, I played that video because I think it's the last time that our country has been rallied around some big purpose that everybody in the country was inspired by. So after President Kennedy gave the We Choose to Go to the Moon speech, that created the opportunity for the black female mathematicians that were featured in the movie Hidden Figures. And Neil Armstrong said that he wasn't getting in that rocket until Katherine Johnson uh, charted his path home. What I believe is that big visions are realized through the voluntary cooperation of a multitude of people of goodwill. The symbol of our country around the world is the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty came about because of masses of French workers donated the money to make the uh, Statue of Liberty. And then Joseph Pulitzer actually did a call of Americans to fund the erect, to make sure that the uh, Statue of Liberty could be erected in New York Harbor. So 125,000 Americans contributed to making sure that the Statue of Liberty would be uh, where it is today. It was not a gift of millionaires. It was a gift of ordinary people in both France and the United States. So what I believe is that we need a movement of people of goodwill dedicated to working together to prove that their free enterprise system works for everybody. And I'm gonna play a 60 second video by Scott Henderson on mutualism. If I can get this to work, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry guys. Hello, my name is Scott Henderson. I'm the Managing Director of the End Motion Accelerator Studio, a generator program located in Lincoln, Nebraska. I want to share a quick thought with you about mutualism, which is a very important complement to the free enterprise system. It's basically when people come together of their own free will to solve problems that emerge in their local communities. So it's played a very important role in our history and our economy. Um, from the rural electric cooperatives that help electrify the countrysides and unlock all that economic potential to the mutual insurance companies that uh, have helped uh, communities deal with fire, crop failure, and other disasters. And it's definitely benefited my own family, my great grandfather, uh, when he was uh, faced with uh, uh, only having to care for three kids on his own, had to turn to the mutual aid societies in his Swedish ethnic enclave uh, to help him get through that time period. So. If you think about it, mutualism as an ethos is the idea of paying it forward and reciprocity so that when you benefit from the fortune of being part of a society, you can help pay it forward to those who have unfortunately seen the misfortune that life brings our way. So there you go. Quick thought on mutualism. Perfect. Uh... So what I believe is that the free enterprise system is worth protecting. We look at the situation of Chicago's black uh, community. We went from first to worst, and this is leading to what I believe is avoidable hopelessness and a damaged brand for our city. So what is the solution in my view is to just do business. The pathway from poverty to prosperity is not a mystery. It begins with entrepreneurial led economic activity but you can't have a business without a customer. So if you're not black, why should you care? It's because I believe our city's in trouble and our city's shrinking, blacks are leaving. Again, this is damaging our brand and not everybody believes in voluntary economic cooperation. So I think that we can cooperate and innovate out of the, the challenges that we're facing as, as a city by proving that the free enterprise system works for the black community. So after 50 years, I think it's time for us to do something new and that what works. Martin Luther King said in 1964, of the good things in life, the Negro has half and of the bad, he has a double share. 
and that the philanthropist must not overlook the circumstances that make philanthropy necessary. And what I believe is that Blacks have an economic ecosystem, not a real estate problem. And if you look at what I believe is that the partnership between Booker T. Washington and a Chicagoan named Julius Rosenwald is the best, was the best example of philanthropy in our country's history. And we'll talk about that shortly. So if you look at our history, economic cooperation between the black business community and the white business community always leads to progress for the country. Again, Julius Rosenwald responded to Booker T. Washington and they built 5,300 schools that educated blacks. And also he helped establish the Negro Business League. Booker T. Washington and education focused on character. They formed the, uh, the Negro Business lead, and what he said was that the, at the bottom of education, politics, and even religion, there must be for all races, economic foundation, prosperity, and independence. And then not long after that, a few black entrepreneurs, including John Rogers' great-grandfather, established one of the freedom colonies that was dubbed by Booker T. Washington as Black Wall Street. And a hundred years ago, more than a hundred years ago, in the middle of Jim Crow, you had an economically successful black town that had its own airport, had airplanes in greater proportions than whites did. That's proof that the free enterprise system works when given a chance. This, Martin Luther King said, while the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act were necessary, they actually did very little to help blacks get out of poverty. So what I believe is that we, this will show that the business participation gap leads to the community wellness gap. This is a study I did based on the 2010 census that shows that blacks are at the bottom of economic participation of all groups and we're at the bottom by a lot. The result of that is that blacks as of the year 2000, 2018, were the only group that made less than they did in the year 2000. Black boys are the least likely of any group to escape poverty. And 70% of black middle-class children will fall out of the middle class by the time that they're adults. But even that $98 billion, which you see there, which is by far the bottom of any ethnicity is not even a real number. It is mostly a pass-through number that large organizations use to get credit for big numbers without losing money. So if you ask yourself the question, where in the world are poor people healthy, educated, and safe? And conversely, where are affluent people, regardless of their race, not healthy, educated, and safe? The answer is nowhere. So how do groups go from poverty to prosperity? In every case, it is entrepreneurial-led economic activity, which leads to the appreciation of education and social capital. Social capital is when you reach back and you pull people from your community along, but more importantly, you create an aspirational roadmap for your young people so they know where to place their bets. I'm gonna play this sh short video here. My name is Micah Askew, I'm 15 years old. Uh, he came to us and, and requested a new cell phone. Uh, we declined the offer. He took it upon himself to look outside and he asked how much we were paying that gentleman to cut our grass. And later on that evening, he came to us with, with a business card that he created. And it started with, with one lady at my church. She was our first client on the west side. We moved for, further and branched out to landscaping and um, more properties and commercial properties, whether it be hospitals, clinics, et cetera. And I was listening to WVON and I heard Robert uh, interviewing some gentleman from University of Illinois. And at some point, Robert mentioned uh, mowers and blowers. At that time, we were hearing about snow removal. So at the time, we were still a uh, pretty small size. We only had one truck. We didn't have any snow materials. And once winter and fall started to roll around, we were like, okay, we have the workforce. We have, uh, we have the experience um, with landscaping. And so I think we'll be able to translate that to snow removal. He gave us the seed money so we can buy our first sets of snow blowers. Since the snow investment from Robert Blackwell Jr., uh, we were able to not only start the snow removal program and the and that other side of the business, but we were able to obtain uh, several building portfolios, one 
with 17 properties in it, without that investment, we've not been able to do so many of the things we've done so far. My name is Mark. Okay. So I would say if, if you want more fishermen, start buying fish. If we fix the demand problem, the supply problem will take care of itself. And I, I've asked this question a thousand times. Name two black, famous black entrepreneurs who would be nationally known with no connection to sports or entertainment. No one has ever been able to answer that question. So why is that important? Because black kids trapped in poverty can't either. The market tells them to place their bets on sports and entertainment, and that's exactly what they do. So what I think is we need fewer saviors and more business partners because black boys rarely see black men doing anything except entertaining people. Uh, I got invited to do a tour of India by the, uh, the ambassador to the US. The long story in sh short of this short was, he said in 1991, they started to free their economy. Their government started doing business with their small entrepreneurs, which prepared them for the international market. And then U.S. business just did business with capable Asian entrepreneurs. They didn't have any special programs. They just did business. And in a period of 20 years, India and China took 750 million people out of poverty. That's double the population of the United States. Uh, I'm going to skip this. This is a, a, a young man named uh, Adam Wisniewski. He used to work for our company, and now he's a successful entrepreneur. He just talks about the uh, why it's important to have black role models in this industry. So Alpha Mission uh, Chicago is about focusing on what has worked in the past. So I believe we need an aspirational movement tied to the free enterprise system that creates a modern version of the Black Wall Street, which creates hope, aspiration, and opportunity for a new generation of people. Uh, 1994, 1995, I was 34 years old. I decided I was going to buy a house in the Black community. I thought we needed economic integration. So I bought a bunch of land, built houses, named them after famous Black people. This was named after Paul Robeson. And that neighborhood is today what I envisioned it would be, which is an economically integrated Black neighborhood where things are better for everybody. And it's the only black neighborhood I know of that is better off today than it was in the year 1967. So while we've made a lot of progress, I believe we've got some unfinished business. Chicago used to be the Mecca of black opportunity. And there were three important Johnsons, they weren't related. Not only did they create hope and aspiration for the nation's black community, but also they were the first funders of Martin Luther King. The Atlanta way in 1973, the black business community and the white business community got together and said, blacks are gonna have political power, whites have economic power, let's create an Atlanta that works for everybody. And today, Atlanta is a better city for everybody. And lastly, we're the, uh, out of Chicago, obviously came President Obama and the black business community played an important role in supporting him early on. So what we're trying to do is to tie opportunity to responsibility by asking companies just do business with a black company that can solve a problem for you and then ask other people to follow your lead. The black companies have to identify a clear value proposition because if you can't do that, you can't be in business. Take on the role of the mentor to bring some younger black companies along and then support what we call community enrichment efforts. And then there's the ecosystem of cooperation and the community impact out of this, which we think will be 1,100 jobs. Black professional services companies get paid to support emerging black businesses, a housing for tutoring exchange, where we give everybody who has a job plus 500 college students a place to live in exchange for mentoring and tutoring elementary and high school kids and providing actually then seed capital. And this is kind of what we call the ecosystem of cooperation. And I won't go into that right now for the sake of time. I'm going to end this with a one minute video by a young woman who works for us now. She came out of CHA. I found out 
about EKI Digital, I was living in uh, Argyle Gardens. And so I read the job description for a junior assistant project coordinator, stepped out on faith and I applied for the job. And um, as God is so good, I was pulled for an interview. I received an offer letter. I was able to move from Argyle Gardens uh, last year in uh, July. Um, I'm actually living now in uh, the Bronzeville area with my employment with EKI. I would not be able to do none of these things. I want to thank all my coworkers for being so so welcoming with me. Um, we all get along well. We all help each other out. I wanted to give utmost thanks to EKI Digital and to Robert Blackwell for welcoming me into the company and a special thanks to my supervisor, uh, me here. No, she's been very, very great to me. Thank you. Okay, guys, thank, thanks very much. Now I'm gonna turn this back over to Avis. Thank you, thank you, Robert. Uh, you inspire us to think big thoughts and dream big dreams and uh, you have been able to pull these things together and begin to make things happen. So uh, we look forward to some really wonderful things happening through the lead partner program. And that is the way that you are going to execute the alpha mission. So now we turn to our panel discussion. We have a wonderful panel for you today. Uh, first, we have Richard Price, chairman and CEO of Mesero. Uh, and you know Mesero, it's an independent employee owned financial service firm founded in 1937 headquartered in Chicago with offices around the globe. And under his leadership, uh, Mr. Price has had Mesero join with the BLC on our lead partner program journey. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Also, we have Mike Lechtenberger, who's the Chief Information Officer for Mutual of Omaha. And in his role, Mr. Lechtenberger oversees all of the company's technology applications, information security and systems infrastructure. And Mike is here because Robert Blackwell is a persuasive man whose lead partner program, uh, the concept is getting traction, not just in, here in Chicago, but also across the country. And then lastly, but certainly not least, Peter Sanderson, who's the Chief Revenue Officer for Nelnet Diversified Services. And Peter and uh, Nelnet see the true opportunities in what we're proposing here and how to make the lead partner program become a reality and just doing business be a meaningful opportunity. So let me thank all three of you for joining us. Thank you so much. Now, let me start with you, Richard. Mesro has a long history of contributing to the well being of our city. So tell me why you decided to make the LEAP Partner Program a part of your mission and why it's important to you in Mesro. Richard, you, <laughs> you got all these wonderful things to say, and we haven't heard a word. Sorry, I've been on mute as uh, instructed earlier, so I apologize. But um, I wanted to um, just tell you how much I appreciate being here. It's a great question. I want to thank Jack for putting this uh, program together. And obviously, you, Avis, for participating and for Robert for, um, I think, creating a, a really uh, compelling uh, story that I think we all have to pay very close attention to. Um, I've been with Mesero. 49 years this July. And I would tell you that from the moment I walked through the door in 1972, the culture of Mesero has really been to support the community. And I think it's evolved over the years in terms of how we provide that support, thinking about the community and thinking about our employees, but partnering with supporting and recognizing minority owned businesses has been a part of our business strategy and corporate culture since I've been part of it. Um, I'm sure a, met, a number of you remember Jim Tyree, our former CEO. He had a number of reader, leadership roles dating back to 2005, all of which I think solidified Mesro's commitment to diversity in business. He chaired the Chicago United Economic Metrical, I can't really pronounce it easily, model, which measured the impact of corporate spending on minority business enterprises in the Chicago area, because for Jim, it wasn't enough to just talk about what we were doing. He really, really wanted to measure the impact of what corporations uh, were doing in the city. He also chaired the Five Forward Supplier Diversity Managers Forum, making Mesro an active partner in the program since its inception. The Five Forward program is very interesting because the initiative looks to build a stronger regional economy through minority business development and build a more competitive pool of diverse businesses. 
through our ongoing commitment, we aim to increase the amount of business we do with local minority firms, but we know we can do better and can do more, which is why we joined the BLC as a lead partner. It's an incredibly um, um, impactful program, but I think that uh, um, the benefit of the program is us being able to participate and then do something and not just talk about it. Together, we're on a mission to increase the number of MBEs of scale and turning in turn, creating more jobs and communities of color, in communities of color, which is really important to the economic development uh, of those communities. BLC guides and supports lead partners like Mesro in establishing meaningful business relationships with black owned businesses. One aspect of the lead partner program is, is particularly exciting to me is the fact that we, as uh, we can look at vendors we engage and will in turn mentor and support smaller black businesses as subcontractors. So we don't have to dig as deep as we, we might want to, but supporting an organization that then can support other uh, companies, I think is really a great way for us to have a uh, either even deeper impact. Um, and obviously the approach further contributes to strengthening the local economy. We not only do this because it's the right thing to do, it's a smart business decision which reduces our aggregate vendor cost and the cost of talent acquisition and retention something that's very important to Mesero and should be important to all of us. Finally, we consider encouraging other corporations to follow our lead as an important part of our responsibility as a lead partner. We view our commitment and involvement with BLC as an important extension of the work we do with the chamber and a continuation of our efforts with Five Forward. It's the vital work of improving our city through business. So we're excited to participate in it and we look forward to encouraging others to do the same. Thank you so much, Mike. And we all know that Mesro has had such a strong, vital commitment to minority participation. And we certainly remember Jim Tyree as a man of action, not just words. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Mike, let me ask you now, uh, Mutual of Omaha is a national firm and you have decided that you are going to make the commitment and, and take this journey uh, as a result of having been persuaded by Robert Blackwell that just doing business is the path forward for not just black businesses, but for all of us. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you, Avis. And first of all, I just wanna say thank you to the Chicagoland Chamber for hosting this event. And they're very appreciative of this opportunity to uh, share these important messages and uh, to you, Avis, for hosting. So thank you for uh, moderating today. So yeah, it's an interesting story. And, and Robert uh, Blackwell is certainly, um, you know, I think on the right track here. This all came about through some very important efforts, strategic efforts that we have going on at our company to modernize our technology. So like all companies these days, I think we're very engaged in just trying to keep up with the, the pace of technology change. And uh, a result of the the meeting between my CEO, uh, my boss, James Blackledge and Robert, um, really went down a path of, of looking at uh, what is this opportunity that Robert's talking about to just do business? And we got pretty excited about that. My, James shared this with me shortly after his meeting with Robert, got me excited about it, and uh, it kind of went from there. So just the opportunity for us to uh, work more effectively with our Black community to leverage this free market approach that Robert's been talking about is uh, we think we agree that's the right way to create sustainable opportunities for all of our citizens. So we're very excited about that. So I guess, you know, maybe it's um, we're in a, a place where it's not business as usual anymore. I think as a nation, it's not business as usual as we, you know, have dealt with some of the challenges here in 2020, including the pandemic and, and uh, many other issues. It's not business as usual. So we're very open to uh, well aligned uh, partnerships and supplier relationships like uh, what Robert here is proposing. And so uh, the last thing I guess I would say on this is just uh, this this is a deeper community mindset. We're, we're looking for partnerships and, and representation within our community that we think is worth pursuing. It's uh, I guess not unlike President Kennedy's call to action for us. It's something that we can do, we need to do, and uh, we're very excited to be a part of it. Well, we thank you, Mike, because you're modeling the behavior that we'd like to see here in Chicago in our corporate community. What we're talking about in the Lead Partner Program is businesses evaluating their spend and choosing African-American firms that they know will give them value for value. 
You know, this is a business proposition. This is not philanthropy. This is value for value. We're looking for business diversity in the areas of growth and in the jobs of the future. And that is in some way what brings me to Peter Sanderson, who is the chief revenue officer for Nelnet Diversified Services. It's a technology company. And Peter and Nelnet are, are making a conscious decision to move forward into the marketplace with uh, a partnership with an African-American firm. So Peter, talk a little bit about that. Absolutely, thank you very much, Avis. Um, so Nelnet uh, partnered with EKI to deliver digital transformation management services uh, to government and financial services industries. So it was, uh, we, we, the two organizations found one another um, independently, strong companies on their own, together considerably more formidable. So um, combining a multitude of complementary skill sets uh, will transform how organizations manage their otherwise daunting, in many instances, digital modernization and migration efforts. Um, one of the tying, tying back to many of the key elements that have been discussed uh, during this very, very important um, meeting presentation, you know, companies that fail to have inclusion as a core tenet of their ESG principles, uh, they're not only missing out on extraordinary talent across the country, they're also, they tend to be blithely unaware of the power of a diverse range of points of view brings to the equation. Um, something that people aren't, I think, discussing enough. There's the, Many companies miss this. Um, so the Business Leadership Council's lead partner program is really that structure. It'll provide companies with the ability and the structure, the foundational elements to, to step up to the plate. Um, it, to get up on my soapbox for a moment, you, you know, my, our contention, unenlightened companies aren't going to f flourish in the future state. Um, embracing diversity, accelerating business, that's not, those are not mutually exclusive of one another, rather they're foundationally aligned. Um, and so the, yes, the reality that this has to be a sort of a deliberate initiative in corporate America is wrong on many levels, uh, in my humble opinion, however, it's reality. So we've got to be deliberate about solving for this. Um, so along with my colleagues at Nelnet, uh, our partner EKI Digital, Robert, and all the participants in this meeting, I'm committed to changing this narrative so we're not simply collaborating with exceptional people. Uh, it, it's, it's not just a sound bite. We're collectively walking the proverbial walk. So uh, very important initiative and just wanted to thank everybody. I'm humbled to be part of um, uh, such an impressive group. Thank well, thank you. you so much for joining us and for sharing your perspective on this. Uh, let me say that uh, this is an incredibly powerful panel and representative views across the spectrum. And one of the things that really strikes me about all of this is that what you have expressed is a commitment at the CEO level in each of your firms to make this happen. And that's CEO at Hyatt, that's Nelnet, that's Mutual of Omaha, that's Mesereau. It requires ownership at the CEO level if you're really going to do this. And the Lead Partner Program is an important way to really bring change and empowerment to the African-American business community. But you can't have it be an initiative that lives somewhere down in the bowels of your departments where there's no accountability. The CEO has to be mindful and watchful of what's happening and make sure that there is a true and living and measurable commitment because I really do believe that what is not measured is not real. So um, let me say thank you to each and every one of you and turn it back over to uh, my co-host, Jack Lavin, who has put on a, an amazing program today. Thank you so much, Jack, for uh, giving us an opportunity to feature the Lead Partner Program. Great. Thank you, Avis, for serving as our moderator and leading the way uh, to grow and support our Black businesses. Uh, this is such an exciting initiative. As Richard Price says, we can do more, and this is a tangible way to create an ecosystem 
where we're helping black owned businesses and we're creating mentorship and we're creating it as Avis and Richard said in a measurable, tangible way. So we're very excited to be part of this initiative. I want to thank our esteemed speakers, U.S. Congresswoman Robin Kelly, Robert Blackwell Jr., uh, Ty Tyrone Studemeyer, Mike Lechtenberger, Peter Sanderson, and of course, Richard Price. And Richard, thank you for your leadership and being the lead, leading Mesero to be a part of this lead partner commitment. We appreciate all of your partnership and everyone here on today's call, support of the Chicagoland Chamber and our business community. Um, there are already a handful of companies that have committed to the lead partner program, including, uh, as we heard, Mesero, but also J.P. Morgan Chase, Landmark Development, Hyatt, Mutual of Omaha, Nelnet, and I think there's been a few in the chat that have committed today. So we're very excited. The Chamber team will be sending out an email with a link to the Business Leadership Council Lead Partner Program website. I encourage you to commit today and support uh, the black community through economic participation. It all starts with a simple commitment, just do business. The chamber is all in to just do business. We are committed to supporting the lead partner program. We look forward to our partnership with Avis and the Business Leadership Council. Thank you, Avis, for your leadership. Thank you, Robert, for helping uh, bring this, bring us all together. Um, I hope uh, that you will all join today and commit to this important program. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great rest of your week and visit the Chicagoland Chamber website too, because we'll have information on our website there. But thank you all for joining us. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, everyone.